Becoming your strongest financial self? Good plan. Northwestern Mutual's Guide to Good Financial Planning can help you balance spending and saving, set goals, and start creating the life you want to be living. Get it today at northwesternmutual.com slash good plan. The Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home. Hey parents, Greenlight is here to take one big thing off your to-do list, teaching your kids about money. With a Greenlight debit card and money app of their own, Kids and teens learn to earn, save, and invest. You can send money instantly, set flexible controls, and get real-time notifications of your kids' money activity. Set up chores and put allowance on autopilot to reward them for their hard work. Then learn about the world of money together. Get one month free when you sign up at greenlight.com slash podcast. Looking for a fun way to win 25 times your money this football and basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com/play100 and use code play100. That's code play100 at prizepicks.com/play100 for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Pay doctor portrayal. I didn't see it coming. Life can be so unpredictable. After losing my dad, it made me think about my family if something were to happen to me. The mortgage, car payments, and all the other bills. Even things like our annual summer vacation would be out of reach. I had heard about life insurance through Ethos and how easy it was to get coverage. They were right. I knew it was time to stop putting it off and get life insurance right now. I got on my computer and went to ethoslife.com. In just 10 minutes, I was covered. And boom, family protected. Thanks to Ethos, my family won't have to worry about the bills if the unpredictable happens to me. Ethos, fast and easy online term life insurance. Up to $2 million in coverage with no medical exam. Some policies as low as a dollar a day. Answer a few health questions and get your free quote at ethoslife.com slash audio. That's E-T-H-O-S life dot com slash audio. Hello, this is international football commentator Derek Ray, and you're listening to the Ranks FC podcast. Hello, Rank Squad, and welcome to Ranks SC. It's your favourite football podcast back for another week and back with a very special guest today. We're going to be joined by Mr. Lee Scott, who is Chief Scout at Velez in Spain. He is a wonderful speaker and we're going to hear all about his career as a scout and to take a little bit of a deep dive into that industry as a whole. Uh, before that, I'm joined by the rank god, Mr. Sam Tsai. How you doing, mate? I'm doing great, mate. Lovely to join you. And uh, conspicuous by his absence is our usual third member. Where is Dean Jones? I can tell you where he is. He's been taken in. He couldn't handle the weekend's football. Remember after last week, remember things we love, where he relayed how difficult he was finding the process of the unpredictability of football. Well, after Liverpool beat Manchester United 7-0, they went on and lost 1-0 to Bournemouth, a team who started the day in 20th place, bottom of the Premier League. I'm afraid that this level of unpredictability was just a little bit too much for our Dean. He couldn't handle it. His poor brain exploded and he can't be with us today. 
Yeah, I mean, and also United bounced back from that loss and played really well against Betis, basically put that tie to bed in the Europa League and then promptly drew with Southampton. <laughs> so it, it all who went... By, who by that mad. point were actually then bottom of the league because Bournemouth had over, over, overlooked them. So, uh, yeah, poor Dean Jones. He's just He doesn't know where to turn. He doesn't know where it, to look. He's not been able to cope. I mean, it was a mad weekend of football, Sam. You and Dean discussed in great detail uh, on yesterday's Postbox episode that went out on our Patreon uh, whilst I was travelling back from Scotland. It wasn't a great weekend of football for me, mostly because I went to basically do Ranks RFC. I've watched a lot of rugby this weekend. <laughs> I was in Scotland at Murrayfield to watch Ireland get another step closer to the Grand Slam in the Six Nations. It's been a very rugby-heavy weekend for me, but it was a mad weekend of football. We probably just about can have a little discussion of before we get Lee in to join us. Yeah, I bet you're glad that you weren't there for Fulham nil Arsenal 3, were you? Well, it would have been an opportunity, as you say, to watch a team in fine fettle. Unfortunately, that team is not Fulham. <laughs> no, it's not. Not at all. And look, the Liverpool-Bournemouth game was was crazy. I mean, it was basically the start of the weekend for us, you know, early kickoff on the Saturday. It's a game that, you know, the big teams have sort of traditionally struggled with of late. Uh, the 12.30 Saturday kickoff is proving to be a tough customer for not just Liverpool, but for others as well. And they did actually start really well in this game really, really well. First 20, 25 minutes, they were they were clearly the better side. Um, but when it wouldn't quite go their way, and when they did have to deal with a setback in terms of a goal, they didn't respond very well, which felt very strange because this is a team, if you could pick any team in world football that should have been on the most immense confidence high, backing themselves to the hilt, it surely would have been the team that just beat their great rivals 7-0. And yet Bournemouth score one goal, one goal, and it one measly wrong. goal. One measly goal and it all goes wrong. Credit to Bournemouth, who I think pushed Liverpool's buttons really well. Dango Watara was really, really good, uh, breaking in off the right flank and, and cutting in behind. Van Dijk had a, in a terrible first half, Jack. Not only did he miss the sitter, but he was really struggling to keep up with Watara. And very rarely do you see him slowed down by the attacker and then sped up again and beat yeah. him. Van Dyke never used to do that. If you slowed him down, he would speed back up at the same rate and block your cross. It's not happening right now. Bit con bit concerning for Liverpool. It had a, a real rotter of a first half, and I think that kind of set the tone. Maybe those Liverpool players are looking at Van Dyke, and if he's not playing well, they're not feeling too confident either. But hell of a hell of a result to kick off the weekend, and yeah, it was just carnage from there, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it just didn't just didn't land for Liverpool, and obviously they have the unenviable task of going to the better bear and trying to overturn a, a five-two deficit this week. So that's not going to be easy either. You were at a game though this weekend in the Premier League, Sam. I did. Yeah, I went to a game. I went to uh, West Ham against Aston Villa. Thought at that time I went back to the London Stadium. I keep bad mouthing it, so I thought I'd go and check to see if my criticisms are still accurate. Uh, yes, they are, uh, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily round on the stadium this time around. I would, I would, I would pick holes in um, the two teams' finishing capabilities. Uh, I think, I think it's pretty clear why one team is sort of marooned in mid-table. Probably not going to challenge for Europe, but not going to get relegated either. That would be Villa, and why West Ham are are right in the thick of it. And what you really take away from this was, as I was walking out the stadium, you know it very well, Jack. You get the little pockets of conversations, the little grumblings, yes. the little moans. You, you hear a couple of people over there talking about this. You hear another pocket of people over there talking about that. And very often it, it reflects the the mood of the fan base, those little conversations, those muttered conversations as you step out of the stadium. And there are deep, deep concerns in the West Ham territory. Uh, you know, they want to see more of Skamaka. They don't want to see Danny Ings up front on his own. They're worried about this. They're worried about that. They hate Thomas Suchek, Jack. <laughs> Yeah, they really, really they're really not pleased oh, with him at the moment. Oh, they really hate him. And you know what? I understand their concerns. You know, you've got a midfield of uh, Lucas Pakitar and Declan Rice, you know, this, and you've got Italy's number nine in the squad. You've got enough here. Jared Bowen had a really good game, but couldn't necessarily make it count. It is amazing that this West Ham team are still in this mire, but that they are, and they're going to have to find a way out of it. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's very mucky at the bottom of the Premier League table. That relegation scrap is really turning into one of the most exciting elements of this season. I believe it's six teams on in a three point gap between mm. Southampton on twenty two and Everton on twenty five. Obviously, there's different games in hand going on there. Forest just a point above that. 
uh, on 26. And then Wolves and Crystal Palace on 27. Five points separate 12th to 20th in the Premier League. That is going to be one for the ages. Do you know I've had a bad time of it this weekend? The top half, well, the top six in Serie A, minus Napoli, who extended their lead at the top of the table to 18 points with 12 games to play. Surely even Napoli can't mess it up from here. But <laughs> Inter lost, Lazio drew, Milan drew, Roma lost, Atalanta lost. I mean, admittedly to Napoli. But mm. it really wasn't a good a good weekend at the top of Serie A for anyone apart from the Neapolitans. And I suppose Juventus, who, who won 4-2 and have dragged themselves to within four points of Atalanta in sixth now. It's one of those where... That 15-point deduction, Juve, despite the fact that they're having a quite a bad season by anyone's standards, if they hadn't had a 15-point deduction, would be second. Would be yeah. second in Serie A. I know. It's, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? I mean, it was, it was all set up, really, for AC Milan here, wasn't it? To, to walk in on the Monday and play against Selenitana and just pick up the three points that would really catapult their confidence and their position and say, well, they're at home to Salernitana, who are on their 18,000th manager of the year. It, like, it's just such a simple task. And yet, and yet, it wouldn't be very Serie A, would it, for them to just waltz away with the three points? And, and they were held. And, you know, there was a good performance from Mike Magnon in goal at one end. He produced what was basically a last-man tackle um, with, a, with a striker throw on goal to prevent a goal early doors. And then later on as well, actually through, throughout the game, Guillermo Ochoa was was excellent on the line, parrying shots away for Salernitana as well. So really, really good. A quite entertaining game. But like Milan came into that thinking, right, Inter have lost to Spezia. Atalanta have lost to Napoli. It's all shaping up. Let's take a nice step forward. That's not how it works. No, no. Just uh, could have gone level with Inter on, on points and uh, managed to remain in fourth, just a point ahead of Roma. He probably had it the worst of anyone. So uh, I suppose they'll live yeah. it. Right. We'll leave it there, though. And we're going to be joined after this short break by Mr. Lee Scott. I'm really, really excited about this interview. Uh, so I can't wait for you to hear it. Don't go anywhere. Looking for a fun way to win 25 times your money this football and basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash play100 and use code play100. That's code play100 at prizepicks.com slash play100 for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Welcome back to Ranks FC, where I'm delighted to say that we are joined by Mr. Lee Scott. Many of you will know him from at FM Analysis on Twitter. He's the chief scout of Belez in the fourth tier of Spanish football. Lee's worked with Hibernian, with St. Mirren, with Partick Thistle, with a load of different clubs. He's the co-founder of Total Football Analysis, working with various clubs around the planet, a regular contributor as well with our pals over at Scouted Football. The author of three books about Pep and City, about Klopp, about Bielsa's time in the Premier League. Lee, this is quite the achievement list. It's a delight to have you on the podcast. Thanks very much. I really appreciate you having me on. I think I'm going to have to clip that intro so I can I play it back on my phone as my ringtone or something. <laughs> <laughs> I say, Lee, you're a very busy man. You're a very busy man. You've got up to a lot of stuff. I mean, people have been telling me that I should write a book and I said I've never got time for it. Uh, when the reality is it's true. I, I like I just don't. And look at you with three books, despite having all these jobs and, and working in all these different areas of football, trying different things, you know, writing, blogging, uh, scouting, analytics, data, podcasting. It's its incredible, mate. You, you really do. You really do get a lot done. Yeah, I, I don't quite know how it all fits in, to be honest. I think I've got a very understanding wife, put it that way. 
<laughs> she's, she's the driving force behind it all and maybe she just gets sick of me a little bit and tells me to go off and do something in the other room while she she chills out in the evenings yeah well i mean i, I think that's that's a fair point it's a fair point i mean look we, we we start with this from douglas who basically said i'd love to hear lee's career path the stops along the way and career achievement so i mean i feel like i've i've done a kind of vague roadmap but there, there's plenty more in in the pipeline there Lee. Yeah, so I kind kind of a strange path, I think, to where I am now. I, I started blogging when a good few years ago, when when blogging just really started to take off. I started to write about football, but it was more from a tactical perspective all the time. So it wasn't specifically player reports or player focused. It was more, you know, breaking down teams' tactical concepts. And I wrote for sites like these Football Times. Um, back at the time, they were the first ones actually to give me a paid gig to write on. So that was kind of my, my start, if you like. Um, and I never thought about that actually being a route into the game. It was just something I did because I found it interesting. And platform kind of grew organically from there. And I started to gain a few followers on social media. Um, and it just kind of steamrolled a little bit. And then one day I got a message out of the blue from somebody who worked for Hibernian up here in Scotland who asked if we could have a chat and that led to some live scouting opportunities which was really interesting and a different way of looking at it and a learning experience for me um and then from there i just kind of moved between clubs from the end of one season to the next my contact at hebs moved i went with him to st mirren when jack ross was still the manager of st mirren when they got promoted to the premier league here and i was doing opposition analysis for them at that point so not player scouting anymore um, from there, I had a little bit of time with Park Thistle, then some time with Dundee United, and then I was lucky enough to get a more of a footprint, I suppose, at Aberdeen, which is actually the club I support um, as a recruitment analyst. Kind of being the first time that clubs ever used data; they, they never used data previously in the recruitment at all. And I set all of that up, and we had quite a successful transfer window last season. But then that then turned into an opportunity to work as I am now for Velez as chief scout. And alongside all of that, I've kept writing, I've kept all those sort of things going. I was still working and consulting with Total Football Analysis at the time. So while I was working for all these clubs, it was obviously a part-time basis. And I was also working for Total Football Analysis at the same time until this point when I'm now full-time with Velez and kind of missing writing a little bit, I think. I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that was so. When did you get the Velez job? Because I feel like you were at Aberdeen relatively recently. weren't you there when they sold Calvin Ramsey to Liverpool? Yeah, yeah. So I was at Aberdeen for pretty much bang on a year. Um, I, October twenty twenty one to October twenty twenty two, and at that point, I was approached by Velez to interview for the post for chief scout. Um, went through that purpose, that process, and got the job offer, and then. Um, went back to Aberdeen and said, I've had a job offer, can you match terms? And they said they couldn't, so kind of mind was made up and it was time to move on and try something else, more of a, a decision-making role, I think, as well, and more responsibility. But, yeah, working for Aberdeen, we had quite a few big transfers in the time I was there, relatively speaking, I suppose, for Scotland. Yeah, fair enough. What's what um what's it like to work for the club you support? I am consistently told by those in the industry that it's something maybe you should be cautious about going into. Yeah, it's horrible. Horrible. <laughs> I, I'm I'm bad enough normally if the club that I'm working for loses, I'm bad enough normally. That's magnified when it's Aberdeen. Because I still live here. My kids are all Aberdeen fans, my wife's an Aberdeen fan. I coach one of my kids' football teams and all the other coaches for the club he plays for. They're all Aberdeen fans, so you can't go anywhere without somebody wanting to speak to you about Aberdeen, which is great when we're doing well. But when you're doing badly, as we were for a period while I was there, it becomes just, yeah, it, it's such a difficult thing. And I think I, I wouldn't change it for the world because I, I like to think that I made quite a positive impact while I was there, and obviously it's my club. But at the same time, I don't think I could go back and, and do it all over again. Yeah, I, I can see that. There's, it, it's one of those things where it's just, as you say, magnified emotions within the game just seem to be something you were like, oh, God, I, I think we can probably steer <laughs> steer away from it as best as we can. I mean, what's the general reaction, Ali, 
back home when you meet people and tell them you're the chief scout for a, a lower league Spanish team? It must be a, a kind of sort of, oh, right. And from here for one and two, just kind of, it's a real kind of change of pace, if you will. Yeah, I think at first there's quite a lot of confusion I mean, they, they don't quite understand. A lot of people don't understand that that's possible as a job and that's a thing. So um, I think once you kind of have the conversation with somebody, though, and you explain how you do it and what you do and what the point of it is, then there's a little bit more excitement, I think. And obviously, often a lot of people have a lot of questions in the back of that as to kind of how it all works and how they could get into doing something like that. Because people who love football, the the thought of a job where you watch football all day as your job is just, I mean, you guys have the same thing. You you must have games on all the time the same way that I do. It's privileged to be able to do it. So then a lot of people look at that and look at their own day jobs and think, well, I'd like a piece of that. But then I think at times people maybe underestimate how difficult it can be to break into as an industry when there are so many people out there who want to become a scout and want to get to the level where they're getting paid to do that, that it becomes difficult just for somebody to, to suddenly make that switch and decide, I'm going to stop my job now, I'm going to be a scout and that's it. That They, they don't understand it's not something that you can generally just apply for and not like a normal job and get into that you have to go through a whole world of hurt sometimes to get a foothold. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, let's come on to that role, shall we? I know Sam, you wanted to to kind of start on on Lee's current role with the kind of asking about how how it kind of works. For, for like. <laughs> yeah, I mean that would that'd be a good way to start, wouldn't it? How does your role work? I mean, we've got a question here, which is essentially asking the split in your role. So, I'd like to know really, you know, what percentage of it is, you know, traditional scouting, as you would probably call it, i.e. in person, you know, game stuff. Uh, How much of it is video scouting and how much of it is data driven? And what's your kind of percentage split between the three if you do, in fact, use all three methods? Yeah, at the moment, it would be much more heavily weighted towards data and video, Um, just geographically speaking, because of the the areas that we're scouting at the moment. What we are doing at Velez is trying to cast a wider net as opposed to what clubs typically do in the fourth tier Spanish football. Um, We obviously have an emphasis of the Spanish market because we have to have, but the club has a very clearly defined way that we want to play. And to be able to achieve that, we need players who have certain characteristics. And in some cases that will be found elsewhere. So I would say at the moment it would be about 85% 85% data and video, which I use together. Um, part of my role I was taken on because I have a data background and the ability to use data to identify players quickly and to cut through all the noise of players who might be available to play in the fourth tier of Spanish football. And then the remaining percentage would be live scouting, but that would be very targeted. Um, we've got quite a hands-on director of football, Magnus Pearson, who used to be, he was a professional player. He was the national team manager of Estonia. He was a manager at Jure Garden, Malmo and other clubs in Sweden. Um, so he's quite hands-on and willing to go out. When I first took the job, he was on a scouting trip out in Nigeria, for example, watching players out there domestically. And on the back of that, we signed three teenage Nigerians in the winter. Um, so between us, we are willing to go out to games, but that will be more targeted towards probably the end of May, beginning of June, when we start to really hone in on targets for the summer. I mean, I suppose it takes quite nicely on to this question from Lucas. He said, what are the things that you prefer looking at in video versus in person and and vice versa? And I suppose it kind of feeds into that idea of not just it being geographically tricky at times to, to do these things, but also the fact that when targets are kind of identified later on in the process, what's the bit then, you know, you, the, the data says these things are fine and, and you kind of can find those things. But what are the things that you then go and look at a player in person for and go, well, that's the standout characteristic that we're looking for at this exact moment? It's going to sound really weird, but one of the biggest ones that you can't get from video scouting is height. And the yeah. market is a nightmare. I don't know where they get their heights from. I've seen transfer market try to tell me a player's five foot seven when he's huge. And That's <laughs> Ivan Tony, isn't it? <laughs> the Ivan Tony debate. He's the poster boy for this, yeah. Um, just it's sometimes just when you're live scouting, 
people talk about the feel and the fact that scouts get a feel for a player. What they're talking about is that sense when you're in a ground, you've all been there, when a player gets the ball. So at the moment, if you think about Napoli, when Kavicha gets the ball for Napoli at the moment, the buzz that goes around mm-hmm. everywhere. And getting that sense of a player and what all these other it's wisdom of the crowd, what all these other people sitting around you that see this player all the time, if they instantly get nervous when a midfielder or defender's on the ball, instantly you're thinking to yourself, well, that's obviously there's a problem in terms of distribution and technique and composure. But then you're also able to watch when you're live. You can obviously you can watch the player the whole time, so you're seeing his movement, you're seeing the, the pockets he tries to get into. But you're also seeing the way that he interacts with people. So I I used to get mocked for this um, when I was scouting for other teams, but I never did the lounge thing. When you went to a stadium scouting, you get access to the lounge where you go get some food and get a hot drink and everything else. I would be in my seat at least 45 minutes before kickoff, and I would stay at least 20 minutes after the final whistle, just so I could see the way the player that I was interested in reacted to people, physios, coaches in the warm-up, how he warms up, is he just arsing about with the ball, doing keepy-ups and doing flicks and tricks, or is he switched on when they're doing the warm-up drills? After the game, how does he react to the fans around him? Does he come over at the fans and speak to them when the ball boys are there? Is he speaking to the ball boys and being you know, a decent person, or is he just completely ignoring them and straight down the tunnel? And all these little things give you hints about the player. But I think on video, you do get quite a lot of the sense of how somebody reacts to disappointment because you'll see their clips, for example. If a player doesn't get the pass they're looking for, do the arms go up and he shouts and he swears and he's not happy with the teammates? If he loses the ball, is he blaming other people and not taking responsibility or does he lose the ball and immediately counter press? It's all of these little details that you're looking for, not just, you know, can this player pass, tackle, head, shoot? It's everything else that goes around the game that you kind of have to zone in on. I take it it's not necessarily, though, that like, you know, remonstrating and complaining at teammates and throwing your arms up in the air. It's not always a bad thing, right? I think we we sort of paint that as like that is a negative. But like I was at a game this weekend. I went to West Ham against Villa and Matty Cash and Alex Moreno, the fullbacks, were getting absolutely torched. And Moreno really needed help against Jared Bowen. And he was getting nothing. And he was asking his teammates and they were giving him nothing. So he was asking them again more firmly, nothing. And Matty Cash in the second half, switchball kept coming over. He was getting done on the on the run on his blind side. And he kept screaming to the left, you've got to shut this ball down more. And they kept ignoring him. So he got louder and louder. I don't necessarily see these as negatives because they're, they're demanding more from their teammates. So I feel yeah. like maybe there is a... A common uh, a, th- a thread, maybe a, th- um, a theory that this sort these sort of actions are bad, when surely they're not necessarily always bad. So you have to also discern between those, right? Yeah, and I think the easiest way to do that is look at the teammate's reaction to that. So mm-hmm. in that instance, that player is given communication, and that communication, when you coach your young player, you're talking to them all the time about communicating with one another and how they react to that communication. If your teammate is giving you information you have to be able to react to it properly. So he's trying to tell his teammates to either support him when the the switch comes over or stop the switch at source. It's all good information. But if when they throw the ball, their arms up in the air and they're remonstrating and they're mad about it, if teammates are instantly, you see them, you see them rolling their eyes or turning their backs or, you know, just waving the arm away because they're not interested, then it becomes more of an issue, I think. And sometimes players react like that because they are so unbelievably driven I mean, one of my favourite examples when people ask me about players that I messed up on, I said Bruno Fernandes would be a terrible signing for Manchester United. And I've I've said that multiple times on different podcasts and things. And part of that was because of his remonstrations with teammates. You see it just now. If things aren't going his way, his head just goes. And it's not something that can be coached out of him because it's just part of his personality. He's so driven to win. And you have to balance as a scout and as a decision maker and somebody who's recruiting, how big an influence, how big a problem do you think that will be with your squad? Is that something you can get past for the talent? Or do you have to look at it and say, if he comes here and starts behaving like that, he's going to lose his teammates and then it becomes a huge problem. If you kind of take that into a 
cultural level, if you will, for, for a minute, you know, obviously when you broke into the industry, you're watching top tier football, you look at the books you've written, Lee, they're about the Premier League champions. And then you're kind of flipping that to look down into, you know, Velez and, and where they're trying to get to. How does how does that work in terms of de- dealing with different, not necessarily levels of players, but obviously the the demands to win from from a Klopp side, for example, are going to be different and, and what you're looking at from those analytic perspectives towards what you're doing in terms of trying to build a, a longer term project in Spain. And then the cultural differences of obviously this not being your first language, etc. How How does that all translate within the role? It's interesting. The role, it doesn't, it, the language barrier is not a problem within the role because English is the language spoken at the club. Um, the club is owned and run by uh, Swedish investors and two Swedes, so Magnus Persson and Jesper. I forget Jesper's surname, all of a sudden now I'm on the spot. But the two of them were basically long term coaches and managers, and they got to the point where they realized that if they wanted to actually build a club properly, they had to do it from above the head coach manager position. So they got investors together and they decided to buy a club and they decided to buy a club somewhere that was warm. So Malaga was perfect because the climate's great. <laughs> better than Scotland, better than Sweden. So let's just go with it. So that's how they ended up at Velez. There, was a, there were three or four different clubs under consideration, but they were the ones that they ended up buying. Um, so everything at the club is kind of ran through English We've actually got an English manager now, um, Michael Jolly, who was Grimsby Town manager, amongst others, was actually appointed uh, last a month ago now after his visa process. So he's been in post now for five or six games. Um, when we're looking at players as well, when we're talking about different languages, Spanish and English are kind of languages that we like to target. So in terms of language, that's not a problem, but it can be difficult when you're adjusting your eye to watch football at different levels so <clears throat> yeah when i'm watching football on tv for enjoyment when you're watching top five league football champions league football it doesn't really cross over to what i'm doing on a day-to-day basis yesterday for example i was watching a, a game from the second division of the united arab emirates league and wonderful backdrop for the game with the, the arabian mountains behind and everything else but very difficult to judge in terms of league quality, player quality. It becomes about how you can adjust the way that you see the game to understand what talent looks like at that level. So when I first started, Magnus was in Nigeria. So he was sending back footage of these players who were playing in Nigerian youth leagues and for the, the African youth teams. And I was watching domestic African football. Having just left Aberdeen a week before, when we were concentrating on Eredivisie, um, Hungary, different of Serbia, places like that. So all these different countries in Europe were kind of my remit at Aberdeen. And now all of a sudden I'm trying to adjust to watching people in Africa play in a horrible pitch when the heat is through the roof and the tempo of the game is down. And then when you come back to the Spanish league and you're watching Portuguese third tier, Portuguese second tier, Spanish fourth tier, it's about being able to understand that not everything looks the same but certain characteristics of the game still are the same so quite a lot of our game model and our squad model is profiled based on Jurgen Klopp and his Liverpool side from a few years ago so our front three profiles would be not so much the the false nine anymore but the two wingers we want to have the same characteristics as Sadio Mane from the left and Mohamed Salah from the right we want them to be able to run behind and make those diagonal movements to get up beyond the striker. So being able to take the main characteristics of the players at top level and then apply that to the players that we're watching is where we think we can get an edge. Yeah, Lee, something you said there about the different levels and you mentioned like pitches and weather and stuff. I think it's something we probably all underestimate a little bit. And uh, you may have, you've been watching uh, some some second division Middle Eastern football on the on Monday night. I was watching uh, Danish football on Monday night. Nice 6 p.m. kickoff just before I tuned in and settled down with my wife to watch the final episode of The Last of Us. And uh, I watched uh, Aarhus, AGF. They played Randers. And the pitch was atrocious. It was so, so, so bad. And a lot of the Scandinavian games that I've watched over the last month or so since the league returned have been on atrocious pitches because of the weather. The wind 
was so bad that when the goalkeeper put the ball down to take a goal kick, it would roll backwards and he'd have to stand and go and fetch it and put it back. And the ref wouldn't let him take the goal kick until it was stationary. These things make surely make scouting players so, so difficult. Like, How do you negotiate these situations? Uh, and video is not such a deal breaker because you can just you can watch the clips and then you can skip to another game if need be and find another game. But when you turn up live to watch a game and that's a situation, that's a nightmare. It, it's horrible because you're in the same situation. You know that half the people in the crowd and that are sitting scouting as well are already thinking about the drive home because the weather's atrocious. And uh. you've got to try and, try and concentrate on this game. And you're right, sometimes in... And that's why, obviously, these leagues are summer leagues because they're going to come out. Well, Denmark's not, but Sweden, Norway, they're going to come out now with this bad weather period and play over the summer, and it's going to be okay for them for the most yeah. part. But if when you're watching a player specifically and you're at a game that's like that, the best example up in Scotland is at a ground called Gayfield Park. Oh, it's where the course is down to the sea, is it not? In the north? Yes. The wall is on the sea, so basically the back of the stand, if the ball goes behind that stand, it's in the water, the ball's gone. And if you turn up to a game there in bad weather, it's just that the players can't get a touch on the ball because of the wind's howling in off the North Sea. I mean, Pataudry, where Aberdeen plays bad enough because we're close to the beach and the wind comes down the corners that don't have stands. But sometimes in those situations, it gives you an opportunity because if you're watching a player and... The way that I see it, you can find a player almost anywhere. You, you can spot a player almost any game. Anyone can watch a player and go, I like him. He's a good player. If you're at a game where the pitch is covered in mud or it's waterlogged or there's snow on the ground or the wind's howling and that player still has a touch, still has the ability to take the ball, to get his head up, to get turned and try to play football, then all of a sudden that should be setting off the alarm in your head that there's something there. Um at the same time, if the player can't get his touch, if every pass goes 15 metres wide of where he's trying to put it and he can't shoot, then you probably give him a pass because of the weather and move on to the next one. But if you do see that moment of brilliance, then in that bad weather, it does probably magnify a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I suppose this is quite a nice one to, to kind of work on to the difference between when you have a player that you like via video and, and data and then you go to see them and maybe... The, the eye test doesn't necessarily match up with it. We had a couple of questions on this. Trevor said, can you describe a time where you had to make a decision based on conflicting reports or data? And how did you make the final call? And, and Nico said, is it hard to separate you know, what you're seeing on a player versus what the stats might say otherwise? And if there is any examples of that. But I imagine this kind of scenario within these difficult climates with which to, which to work make this even harder in those situations. Yeah, I, I think... <clears throat> especially when I was back with Aberdeen, I, I was very much driven by the data and it worked with us to an extent because some of the signings we got in have done well and, and progressed. But my boss, um, the guy called Darren Mowbray, Tony Mowbray's brother, actually, um, he got the job at Aberdeen Head of Recruitment. I kind of made contact with him. He brought me in and then offered me the position at the club. And Darren was great to work with. Um, really, really good guy and a really good scout. But I think he probably came close to deleting my number the amount of times I text him with Elliot Watt's name when Elliot Watt was still at Bradford City in League yeah. Two. Yeah. Um, Elliot Watt is now at Salford City and his data was through the roof for in terms of progressive passes from midfield. One of the best data sets you're ever likely to see. There was him and Aaron Morley, who I can't remember who he was at the time. He was Rochdale at the time and now he's gone on to Bolton Wanderers and doing really really well but Elliot Watt was the one I kept saying we've, we've got to look at him we've got to look at him but then when the scouts would go and look at him he was physically very poor at the time now what I would say is I've seen him play for Salford since he's made the move and he's actually got himself in really good shape and the data's still good so I think he's going to push on and have a good career but at the time physically he's really struggled but his data was was supreme so I would constantly be on to Darren saying we need to look at the player and I think he just started ignoring me after a point. Um, it becomes difficult. I mean, it is. You'll all see the players who data. What I really love, I read the book by Ryan O'Hanlon. I can't remember the name of it now. Is it Net Gains? Yeah, like, yeah I, I know what you mean. 
And um, there was a part in the book that said when players st- first started wearing their, their trackers on their chest that measured the physical output, that every time in training the play stopped, players would run across the width of the pitch just on their own because they knew that it would increase their physical output for the, the training session. And I think data, sometimes you've got to look at it like that. You've got to understand the context of what you're seeing within data, and that's something that I've got better at over the last year, two years. I don't just see good data and think good player. I see good data and think I need to go and look at that player to see if it matches what I'm looking at, and that's sometimes where the context comes in. It's got to be tough, though, hasn't it, sometimes? I mean, we're all we're all football fans at the end of the day. We've all got types of players that we like. We've all got certain players that we'll defend. You know, Jack and I sit here and... You know, Bernardo Silva could turn in 15 stinkers in a row. We'd both sit here and defend him, defend him, wouldn't we, Jack, with our yeah, lives? Absolutely. And that's, Zero and Mobile we... could score 100 goals next season and <laughs> Sam would say that he is not a good footballer. So uh, we, we know exactly what kind of players we like and don't like. I appreciate We have, um, even if we're aware of these biases and aware of these likes, it can sometimes be very difficult, can't it, to put it to one side when you're trying to maintain objectivity and neutrality. And particularly when you're trying to compare data and what you know is effective versus what you what you like. Yeah, I think that bias is really interesting. <clears throat> there are some really good books on bias and how to recognise your bias that I've read because it was something that I very quickly became aware of in myself. I like certain types of, types of players. I like wingers who can carry the ball. I like midfielders who break lines with their passes. I like centre-backs who break lines with their passes. But as people would sometimes say to me, yeah, the centre-back's got 15 progressive passes a game, but can he defend? And that's when you kind of start to take a step back and and look more in depth at what you're talking about. Um, And that's why I talked about having context. So the data tells you where to look, but then within that context, the data's good, but why is the data good and does that match up with what you're seeing? I think bias is something that every single person who works in football whether you're a scout or a coach you've got to be aware of your own biases and and what you what you see but at the same time I think sometimes we can take bias and almost take it too far to the point where you're no longer trusting your instinct of which bias is kind of plugged into that a little bit and you're going too far to almost negate that and say well I need to find the fault with this player instead of just accepting that that player's good and that they're strong. Um, I know there's been a lot of, I think the biggest, for me, one of the biggest indicators in recent months about bias has been in the back of the World Cup, obviously because it was a Winter World Cup and Morocco did really well and all of a sudden every Premier League club in the top six is going to sign Amrabat from Fiorentina. Um, he had a fantastic tournament, a fantastic World Cup. And I think he's a very good football player, but is he going to go into Liverpool and fix all their midfield problems? Probably not. I think it's probably unlikely. Is he going to go into a club below that tier and do really, really well? Probably. But he's not going to suddenly become... You saw the amount of Liverpool, Chelsea, Man United fans that were clamouring for the club to go and sign Amrabat because he'd done well from, from Morocco. But you've got to understand that player. And I think sometimes that's why when we are scouting, we try to get, at Velez especially, we don't just go based on one opinion. Every player that we're going to sign has at least three scouts look at him. And each scout looks at at least three games, different games. So we're seeing a lot of different contexts and a lot of different situations for that player. If you're kind of taking that onwards um, and you're looking at players, and especially if the model here, you know, very data driven, as you said, Lee, and the fact that you're, looking at different options and, and different places to bring players in from. I assume there are some players here who are coming from from a level that, that that's kind of far below who have the capacity to, to, to jump upwards. And we got this from Trevor, which I thought was interesting. He said, how do you approach scouting players who might not have had the exposure to the level of competition you're recruiting for? And then what indicators do you use to assess that potential in a, an environment or a competitive environment that they're not currently at? Yeah, it's very difficult. I mean, we we basically split the world up into what we call tiers. So tier one would be top five leagues. Tier 10 would be, I don't know what the bottom level is at the moment, but we put ourselves in about tier six or seven for context. Um, I think oftentimes, I mean, the amount of messages that I get at the moment, either on Twitter or LinkedIn or people who get hold of my email address and my phone number, 
the amount of phone calls or texts or messages that I get from people who say we're playing, I'm currently playing step five in England and I'm looking for a new club next year, would you be interested? I think there has to be a little bit of realism in terms of understanding that the Spanish fourth tier is actually a very good standard. Um, I certainly wouldn't fancy training. Um, I'm, I'm already kind of weary about going out there and getting dragged into a rondo at some point of training because I know that <laughs> I'm absolutely destroyed. And I like to think that I was decent when I was younger, but now just no chance. I think when you what we've done is we've tried to be with that tier list that I talk about, we've kind of we now know which nations, which leagues we have in tiers either immediately with us, one step above and one step below. And that's kind of where we concentrate our scouting for the most part. So there are South American leagues within that, for example, where we will be scouting using data, using video, because we believe that we can get players in there. The players who are playing, uh, probably a good example for your question would be the ones who are playing college football in the States. It's a growing market for a lot of different clubs and players coming through. And, and there is quality there, but it is so diluted the same thing you see with the big American sports when you have the NFL draft, when you have these college NFL players come up to the NFL. There are maybe, what, 10 to 12 in some of the mid-tier colleges who might make it to the NFL. The rest of those players, the level drops off remarkably, and it's the same thing when you're watching soccer in college, when there are players who you look at and you think you've got definitely got talent, but you're probably scoring. There was one where the player scored, he ran past the players, cut inside in his right foot from 25 yards and shot, and you thought, caught that really well, good technique. The goalkeeper put his hands up, caught the ball, and let the ball squeeze straight through and over his shoulder, and straight away you're starting to question the level of competition. So it becomes mm -hmm. about, again, the same thing when we talked about the bad weather and, and how that can impact it. If you see the spark in terms of the player's touch technique, ability to have time to turn, to find a pass, to do something creative, or if they're a defender, are they physically good in terms of turning and defending in space? All of these little things, the technical qualities, if you see that in a player, regardless of if it's a lower level, it gives you enough to say we need to look more. And that's when you have a bigger sample size because there's less likely an opportunity then for you to make a miss because you've got different people looking you're looking at different games, different levels that players play that. Hmm. Yeah. Lee, is there a particular position or type of player that you like to scout the most? Have you got a favourite? Probably number eight. Um, talk about Bernardo Silva, probably my best hmm. favourite player in the world as well. That position, that that ability, and, and it's number eight. I, I was a number eight when I played football, so that's why I quite like it. But I never played number eight the way that players do now when it's that almost free eight the Bernardo Silva, Gundogan, ability to get the ball in the half spaces in those areas and kind of get on the half turn. I think that would be kind of the position that I like the most, which is ironic because it's not really a position that we're looking at Vélez just now. So <laughs> you horn players into positions. No, no, you can definitely play wide. Don't worry, we'll sign him. But... <laughs> is there a least favourite? Uh, goalkeeper. Can't skip well, Okay. Is yeah. there at least favourite outfield position? Dean, Dean, <laughs> Dean Jones would tell you that goalkeepers aren't footballers. Uh, so therefore, the, the remit different, it's is different. So hard with goalkeepers. We uh, Everywhere I've been, we've got goalkeeper coaches to do the main reports. Um, you can still use data. I'd still do reports on goalkeepers, but I don't know what I'm looking at. Mm. I've got no idea. I, I, goalkeepers are mental as far as I'm concerned. So we always make sure that the goalkeeper and coaches get involved. Um, outfield players, I think, possibly centre halves, but that's just because they're so difficult to scout. Um, because again, like goalkeepers, the position of centre half is so unique in terms of their movements and what you expect them to do in the field. Because a good centre half for me is able to play in possession and break lines, as I've talked about. But you also want the ones who are quick and mobile enough, not just fast, but quick at turning their hips and quick at coming out to defend wide areas, one-on-one -on -one isolated? Can they defend back towards their own goal? Are they proactive and aggressive and getting out and trying to get in front of the ball? Or are they reactive and half a step behind? I think there's a lot of different tiers and layers to scouting a centre-half. 
as opposed to a number eight or a striker. In a striker, you're just looking at can he receive the ball, be back to goal, can he run behind, can he generate shooting opportunities? Job done. But centre halves, it seems to be there's more and more, and it's harder to scout them based on data. Yeah, and playing into all that, of course, complicating the whole thing is centre-backs, possibly more than most other positions, are constrained by their system and their tactical approach. So it might be that a player can do four or five things that you're looking for, but is literally not allowed to show it because of other tactical constraints, which obviously makes it all a bit... It's fumbling around in the dark to a point, isn't it? And it probably means, in my experience anyway, that to get a really good handle on the centre-back, you probably need to watch more film and more video of him than almost any other position. Um, And I feel a little bit like that with wingers as well, because they can be so um, hot and cold in terms of production. It feels very difficult sometimes to identify whether a youth player can can take that step up and continue that production. And if they can't, that's a disaster in some cases. But if they can, it's a goldmine. And, it, it, you know, it's very difficult sometimes to figure out exactly where they land. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting that you spoke about wingers there because that's one that we've struggled with a little bit, purely based on the fact that, as I've talked about, we have a very specific game model that we want to play to at Velez. And I would say it's very untypically Spanish, but when we're looking at players who are playing in Spain, there's a level of sameness in terms of the way that the teams play. So the the wingers will all look to drop in towards the ball to receive the ball because they're playing through the thirds and they build up slower. Whereas we want our wingers to show more intensity and we want those wingers to be looking to break the line with forward runs all the time. Mm. But you're not seeing that because that's not the way the clubs are playing. So when you see them, it's like gold dust for us. There was one in particular that we were really keen on in the winter. And his club played like that. They were slow in the build-up. They were methodical. They were doing really well. But there wasn't much intensity because of the way they played. But every time his midfielders or defenders got the ball, when you could see him, he's making this gesture. He's pointing behind the line because he wants them to play that ball because he wants to stretch it and to run behind. But because they kept playing to feet, you just had to keep coming backwards. And that's the kind of non-verbal communication and signs that you need to watch for in players when you're scouting because if you don't see that, you miss the fact that player will fit your system. Um, Centre-halves as well could play a back three, play a back two. The build-up could be completely different to what you're looking for, so you might not see the technical parts in build-up. It becomes, like I say, very layered and very difficult, but also rewarding when you get the right one. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it, it leads us on to kind of a, a more general finishing point, Lee, before, before we let you go. Um, and we have some sort of questions from, from various things, but I think this leads off that. And Jake on Twitter, he said, have you got any examples of players that you love from a scouting perspective, but then never quite panned out when it actually, when it actually came to it? Uh, direct players that you guys would know, probably not many. Um, there have been players that I have been really keen on either from a data perspective or scouting that, that we never went for because they decided the club wasn't going to make that player a priority, if you like. And I touched upon Elliot Watt, who was a personal project of mine, trying to get him into Aberdeen when I was there. There are others when I was here. I think the one that probably got away from us a little bit because the timing was wrong was Tish Delinga, who went to Toulouse. Um, we got on him really quickly when he was in the second tier in the Netherlands and his goal scoring record was unreal. But very quickly it became clear that we were going to be priced out of any deal. There, there was just no chance. Um, he would be one that I think has gone on and done well, but I'm struggling to think quickly of one that you guys might know that, that hasn't panned out because they, they wouldn't have made the headlines. There have been plenty. I'd, I'd be the first one to put my hands up and say that I make mistakes on players. Absolutely. I'm, I'm wrong, like like anybody else would be. But I think you've got to understand when you're wrong and look at the ones that you're wrong on so that you understand for next time. Mm, yeah, I'm currently swallowing that pill right now with Leandro Trossard. Jack won't let me forget about <laughs> it, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, again, you have to look at where you got it wrong, why you got it wrong and figure it out. Um, but there you go. Uh, you've mentioned quite a lot of interesting different people that you've worked with over the course of this, this conversation. I wondered if you might be able to, to tell us possibly the most interesting person that you've come across with uh, and worked with for various reasons in this industry? I don't think I can tell you his name. Um, 
<laughs> when, when I was with Aberdeen, um, we we had a guy who was consulting with us. He wasn't an official member of the scouting team, but he'd worked with Darren before. So Darren kind of paid him a retainer to go to games and to go abroad, to he'd come up to Aberdeen for meetings and things. And this guy was just unbelievable. I mean, he was older, um, certainly not computer generation or data led or anything like that. But when a player's name was mentioned, you would see him pick up his phone and just tap, write a message. And then five minutes later, he'd have three opinions on this player from the player's national team coaches, from a youth coach or another scout, from somebody at his current club. And he'd be able to turn around to you and say, oh, no, we shouldn't do this because X, Y, and Z. Or no, this player, apparently a really great guy, really great trainer, physically fantastic. But because he was only consulting, I think I'd probably get a ball, can I never told you. I'd probably say Magnus, who's the director of football at Vélez, because his career path has been so interesting from being a player who, he actually had a short spell in England as a player, but he had to retire early because of a knee injury. And when he went into coaching and management, he was, um, like I said, the Estonian national team manager, and he did a lot of work there. He with Jed Davies, who a lot of people have probably heard of. He wrote a couple of books on Bielsa and his um, philosophy of playing, um, and he's really interested in like the data analytics side of it. But his knowledge, his experience, is really just something I can learn from all the time. So I'd probably say him to be safe. Yeah, well, it seems like a, it seems like a safe bet, as you say. But he also does sound like, like an incredibly fascinating character. And we have a couple of people who sort of asked. And I know we started right at the top, Lee, by talking about the idea of, of, of lots of people liking the idea of of going into something like scouting, and actually the reality of it can be very, very different. But Ocean Sun said, "How did you become a scout? And what does the career path look like?" But I think this is from Jack is is really interesting. He said, "I've been looking at getting to scouting." I'm currently a youth worker in football and I have been working in that field for eight years, but I'm looking to take those skills into something a bit different and thought that could be partially transferable into scouting young players. Would you agree and what would you advise as a first step? Yeah, I think this is the the question much more than I get players and, and agents messaging me. I get people messaging me asking how to get started and what to do. Um, and I tend to always give the same advice, touching on the person who asked the question first. There's a huge difference between youth scouting and scouting at first team level. I couldn't scout youth players. Couldn't I couldn't tell you of what eight, nine, ten, eleven year olds are likely to make it when they're they're fifteen, sixteen. And I coach um, my middle son. He's eleven. Yeah, he's eleven. He's twelve this year. I coach. <laughs> I know it's terrible. I've, I've got three boys, and I forget their ages all the time. I coach the middle one, um, Thomas and. We have some very, very good players who, at that age group, they're fantastic. They're quick, strong, fast, skillful. They can score goals. But will they be a football player when they're 18? I generally don't know. Um, if you have experience in something like youth work, it means that you can connect with young people, which I think is something that is really, really important for a youth scout or a youth coach. You have to have that ability to connect with a young person on their level and not just be the grown-up, if you like. You have to be able to have a conversation with a young person, which is something that not everybody's comfortable with. So certainly I think there would be some skills that would translate across there, but I wouldn't be the right person to give advice on how to get into youth scouting. I think that would just be a case of going to your local clubs and offering your services and, and seeing how you've gone from there. But in terms of how you get into how to get into scouting, I get a lot of questions about courses. Um, never done any of the courses that you see advertised all the time. I've never been on them, never been in the talent ID courses. They're not essential for getting a job. And the thing that I think some people maybe need to hear, there are no guarantee of getting a job. So please don't think that if you go and spend money doing these courses, do them if you want to, if you find them interesting, absolutely go and do them. I'm a huge proponent of continuous development. So go away and do that if you want to, but don't think that on the back of that, you're absolutely going to get a job. The best piece of advice that I can give people is to find themselves a platform. So my platform is social media and then total football analysis and, and different places like that where I was able to showcase what I could do. 
set up a Twitter account just purely based on what you want to do as a scout. And then on that Twitter account, start to interact with people, but start to put up reports, whether it's from a blog that you're linking to or just even a Twitter thread. I'm not a huge fan of Twitter threads, but if that's what you want to do, then do that. Give your opinion on the player. Give your opinion on the player's strengths and weaknesses, what you see a good move would be. Practice data visualization. You can just use Tableau if you don't want to code. That's absolutely fine. But practice that and show examples of that. But do it on a platform that's consistent. What I've found is that an awful lot of people who work in football clubs have burner accounts on Twitter. You won't know it's them, but I guarantee you, if you do that and you do it consistently and you do it well, people who work in football clubs will be reading what you're doing. And that's probably a better opportunity than just going on courses and then trying to apply for jobs. Because when these jobs come up that are advertised for scouting in clubs, the level of applications that come in are just unreal. So give yourself an opportunity by making your name known that way. That's always my best piece of advice. Yeah, I mean, look, two things on that as we wrap up. First of all, to your point there, it's about proof of work, isn't it? At the end of the day, it's the, the best the best application sometimes you can offer somebody is, is proof that you are already capable of doing that work. And that relates to both of our industri- industries here. This is what I tell young prospective journalists. And they were like, oh, how do I get a job? It's like, well, start writing and then I'll know how good you are. And that is the simplest start that anyone can make. They can start in analytics, they can start in data, they can start in scouting profiles, but just show us what you can do. That's the best proof of what you can do, funnily enough. And then to wrap back round onto Jack's question uh, and, and building off what you said, Lee, youth scouting, whole different ball game, whole different thing. But youth coaching, that's possibly where the transferable skill comes in. It's pos- possibly more of a coaching conversation than a scouting conversation when it comes to relating to young people and working with them there. But that's all we've got for you, Lee. So thank you so much for your time. No worries, guys. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me. It's been a real, real pleasure. Um, You can follow Lee on Twitter at FM Analysis. um, But thank you so much. It's been a a real, real pleasure, Lee. It's been great to have you on the podcast. Thanks, guys. Thank you as well to Mr. Sam Tai for all of those wonderful questions and for compiling the questions from our patrons as well. Yeah, and shouts out to the patrons for supplying them. Uh, brilliant stuff when we're able to get our community and our audience involved. Uh, for those that, that obviously didn't see the process, but if you are one of our patrons, I put a post out on Monday saying we're interviewing Lee. Please get involved with any questions if you've got any. 20 or 30 of you came through, helped shape the interview. We absolutely love it when you do that. And we hope you enjoyed what you had to say. Indeed, indeed. I've been Jack Collins, Knave of Hearts. This has been Ranks FC. Thank you so much for listening as ever. We will be back tomorrow with our Champions League wrap-up show. That will go out pretty much at midnight. And it'll be first thing tomorrow morning for, for most of you listening to this right now. And we'll be looking back at the Champions League games this week, looking at who has made that final eight, the quarter finalists. Four down four to go take it easy gang peace at kroger you can find the highest quality products at a great price in every aisle every day with kroger brand so you can stock up on your household favorites that are tried tested and loved by you because when you get the products you love at great prices it feels like winning shop now in store or online kroger fresh for everyone When it comes to teaching kids and teens about money, practice makes perfect. That's where Greenlight comes in. With a debit card and money app of their own, kids learn to earn, save, spend wisely, and invest. Parents send instant money transfers, create custom chores, and automate allowance, while kids track their spending, set savings goals, and practice money skills they can use today and for life. Get one month free when you sign up at greenlight.com podcast.